Welcome, everybody. I am Dr. Uma Dana Balin. This is the fourth annual Lab Roots Conference. Very excited. And our topic today is about hemp and cannabis. And my lecture today is Cannabis, the Global Solution. I am at Uplifting Health and Wellness in Cambridge, Massachusetts today. A little bit about who I am and where I am from. I am the founder and CEO of Global Health and Hygiene Solutions, established in 2006 with a mission to promote wellness and prevent illness. In 2014, I created the clinic Uplifting Health and Wellness, where cannabis became part of my toolkit. And our mission and our three words are educate, embrace, and empower. Registered trademarks are Cannabis the Exit Drug and Dr. Uma Says. My background, I am originally from India. I came to this country in 1970. I did my medical school in New Jersey Medical School in Newark, New Jersey. I had done research there for about 30 years prior to that as well. And I did also my residency after that at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. In family medicine, after I finished that, I came to Massachusetts and did my second life at the Harvard School of Public Health. I did my master's in public health and my residency in occupational environmental medicine and my fellowship in heavy metals. My mission was about prevention versus more of treatment. I am also a certified medical review officer, and I'm also very proud to say I am certified and a diplomat in the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine, and I have been writing recommendations for cannabis since 2012, initially in the state of Washington and in the state of Massachusetts since 2014. Our objectives today are three in particular. I hope for you to understand what is cannabis, the difference between hemp and marijuana, what is the endocannabinoid system, and how does cannabis work with the ECS, or the endocannabinoid system? What is the role of cannabis both in the medical and industrial products, and why I call it a global solution? Pope Francis said the earth, our home, is beginning to look like an immense pile of filth. It's a very sad statement and truly a problem that we are facing today, locally and globally. My hopes are to give you a solution and why I call cannabis the global solution. Our world has been contaminated by pollution, some of which is natural emissions from the world around us and what we as humans have created. The impact of this pollution has been not only in our local sites, but it has been carried through the air, through the water, and contaminated our waters and also our soil. This process of pollution has withstood time. And what we understand is that it has affected the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the animals that also cohabitate with us. What we realize is the water, the smaller animals, which are consumed by the larger animals, and the larger food chain that we consume, ultimately contamination and poisons that we are exposed to in our day-to-day -day life. And not only today, over time, and what the earth and what the world faces. The health effects of pollution from air pollution and water pollution are immense. It has impacted multiple systems, respiratory illnesses, creating bacteria, 
parasites and chemicals that we see that impact the cardiovascular illnesses, gastric illnesses, even cancer that has been caused. We see air pollution creates carbon monoxide, which impacts particulate matter or ozone, which in fact impacts nerve damage, contamination from lead, from volatile organic compounds, which can affect our skin and cause irritation, just to mention a few. Our air, our water, and our soil are contaminated, causing multiple illnesses throughout the world. What we see is this has impacted every endocrine system, reproductive system, our testes and our ovaries, in our pancreas, affecting digestion and also diabetes and our blood sugars. Our thyroid gland, our parathyroid gland impacting calcium, temperature control, hearts, our kidneys, our adrenal glands, our gastric system, our pituitary gland, every system has been impacted and been disrupted. What is also happening is our world is aging, not just here, but throughout the world. Our elder population is growing and will exceed our younger population expectations and what it has done is also created pandemics throughout the world we have faced this as civilization will continue dating back to black death the plague smallpox the spanish flu hiv and more recently covid19 the impact COVID-19 has had in compared to our population that exists today, over 7 billion compared to back in the day of less than a billion people. As population grows, we may and will expect other pandemics and epidemics to impact us. So how shall we prepare? Dr. Uma says that cannabis is for people, pets, the planet, for peace, and for profit. And to me, your health and wellness is your profit. Today, cannabis is in Schedule 1, along with heroin, LSD, and ecstasy and has been there since 1970 when the Controlled Substance Act was created. But history tells us that doctors had the liberty to write a prescription and cannabis was listed in the pharmacopoeia from 1850 to 1942. Yes, in the United States pharmacopoeia and companies like Park Davis with Eli Lilly were producers of these medications. We also know cannabis was a treatment for neuralgia, tetanus, typhus, cholera, rabies, and dysentery. And guess what? Alcoholism and opioid addiction were treated with cannabis, not the cause of. It treated gout, it treated convulsive disorders, tonsillitis, insanity. Yes, treatment of insanity, not the cause of insanity. We also know that William O'Shaughnessy first learned about this plant, yes, from India, where I am originally from. He had learned about this plant from the Ayurvedic doctors in Calcutta. He had seen how they had used it for all the ailments that I had just mentioned. And yes, he brought the knowledge to Europe and ultimately to the United States, where it was listed as medicine. What we know today is that nobody, nobody in the whole world has ever overdosed or causing a death from cannabis. Tobacco, 
alcohol, caffeine, aspirin, and even water can kill you, but cannabis cannot. What we know is that cannabis was food, fuel, fiber, paper, and medicine. It was replaced by synthetics, 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 synthetics. And these all have names. The Hirsch, the DuPont, the Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Mellon. And yes, these names are known to us today. They were the root cause for what was created from racism and politics and the ultimate greed that put this plant into prohibition. In the 1600s, you were mandated to grow this plant. You even failed jail sentence if you did not grow it. In the 1850s, it was medicine. It was then in the 1800s that things changed and statements like reefer makes darkies, they, I'm gonna repeat that again. Reefer makes darkies think that they are as good as white men. I wish I could show you what a small marijuana cigarette can do to our degenerating residents or Mexican population they were referring to. Racism and politics were the underlying cause of why cannabis was put into prohibition. Marijuana, the most violent drug in the history of mankind. I like to say that it is one of the safest drugs and one of the most important plants, and I like to refer to it as cannabis, as it should be. Cannabis is in Schedule One, along with heroin, LSD, and ecstasy, and it has been there since 1970. Today, drugs are classified into five classes, and cannabis continues to be illegal. But today, we have states where cannabis can be used as medicine and can be written as a recommendation by clinicians and healthcare providers for patients. What we know is that cannabis was available in a form of tinctures in multiple forms, including asthma cigarettes. Yes, asthma cigarettes. And what was in these cigarettes but cannabis? Cannabis was used for the treatment of asthma. As one inhaled it, inhalation caused bronchodilation, vasodilation brought down the inflammation. It was books and magazines created to change the stigma, reefer madness, devil's harvest. But we know the truth today Cannabis is much safer than many of the drugs, and we are facing an opioid epidemic as well. In the words of Dr. Reynolds, he writes in the first issue of The Lancet, when pure and administered carefully, cannabis is one of the most valuable medicines we possess. And yes, today we are learning about more of it. Dr. Raphael Meshulam in Israel, who is known as the grandfather of cannabis, first started to work with cannabis and discovered THC as what he notes as the psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. I like to refer to it as the intoxicating component. In 1992, he also discovered the first endocannabinoid, Endo meaning within our body, and cannabinoid meaning it has something to do with cannabis. He named it anandamide, from the roots of the Sanskrit word meaning ananda, eternal bliss, supreme joy. I, as a clinician, had learned about the respiratory system, the cardiac system, the reproductive system, the lymphatic system in multiple, multiple systems, but I had never, ever, ever learned about the endocannabinoid system. It was not until 2010 when my mom had seen a TV program about how cannabis was being used in Israel 
And I could still hear her saying, they're using ganja. I beelined it into the bedroom and it was being used for COPD, asthma, lung cancer, and PTSD. Did not compute. It was then when my love and my passion brought me to understand that this beautiful system existed. I never got to use this plant for my mother, but it was after her death in January 2012 that I decided that education and to change the stigma regarding cannabis and for the world to know about the endocannabinoid system became my mission and I do it through education. Dr. DiMaggio explains the endocannabinoid system in five beautiful words. He states that the endocannabinoid system is meant for us to relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. I describe the endocannabinoid system in one word, life. If any one of those words, if we can relate to, if your muscle is constantly twitching, or if it just doesn't move enough, if you eat too much obesity, if you don't eat enough anorexia, if you sleep too much depression, if you don't sleep enough PTS, and I like to leave the D off, we are not disorders or diseases. If you forget too much Alzheimer's, if you don't forget enough PTS, if your body overreacts, it creates autoimmune diseases. If it does not react enough, it creates diseases where you are immunocompromised. So remember the words and the mantra, relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. The endocannabinoid system is evolved from a sea squirt to what we have in humans today, over 600 million years. What we know is that the endocannabinoid system works with receptors throughout the body. Two well Receptors that have been studied have been CB1, which is primarily in the brain, and CB2, primarily in the immune system. But we've learned that there's multiple other receptors all through various systems. What is very unique about the endocannabinoid system is that it is very analogous to the nervous system. Presynaptic to postsynaptic. Neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin are created in the presynaptic and they are released and they bind to the postsynaptic. Endocannabinoids are unique in that they are made in the presynaptic and released and bind to the receptors in the postsynaptic. It is a unique retrograde mechanism, ultimately to bring about homeostasis, balance, ease. If you are not at ease, you are at dis-ease. And we have come up with multiple words to describe these diseases, which all ultimately have to do with inflammation. When we talk about cannabinoids, we talk about endocannabinoids, anandamide, which was first discovered by Dr. Mishulam. And in the first drop of breast milk, a baby consumes. And then demise mimics THC. And that is why it works so beautifully with the CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. It helps the baby to relax and to eat and get its nourishment. Phytocannabinoids are cannabinoids derived from plants. And we are talking about the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant, we have identified over 150 different cannabinoids. Synthetic cannabinoids are cannabinoids that are made in the lab. One of the oldest synthetic cannabinoids that we know about is Marinol, which is a synthetic form of THC. One of the newest synthetic cannabinoids that we're aware of and made in the lab, which uses CBD, is Epidiolex. The endocannabinoid system is involved with every system, in the immune system, in the central nervous system, in the gastroenterology system, gastrointestinal 
let me repeat that again, central nervous system, gastrointestinal system, hormones, bones, our metabolism in every system that we have. What I provide is helping people understand today that cannabis is a safe alternative and should be offered as a choice to multiple prescription and over-the-counter medications. Our people are facing multiple diseases. I used to call it the party pack of five as a family physician. Diabetes, hypertension, something for reflux, something for anxiety, something for their sleep as well. Diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, reflux, anxiety, or depression. What we want people to understand is that there can be drug-drug interactions and how metabolism varies due to consumption if one inhales it versus ingesting it or even topically. Understanding that when you inhale it, it goes through the lungs and why you feel the effects much more quickly and rapidly versus ingesting it goes through the liver. It must be absorbed. In the liver, it gets converted from 9-delta to 11-hydroxy, a much more potent com component, which lasts also longer. We explain to our patients how cannabis works, the mechanisms of action. We know that cannabis works as a bronchodilator. It impacts nausea. It is able to help with spasticity. It brings down the intraocular pressure. Why it's used for treatment of glaucoma, respiratory issues, chronic pain, spasticity, and the list goes on and on. When it comes to cancer, I feel very strongly when the diagnosis of cancer is made, cannabis must be included as part of the treatment protocol. We know that cannabis works in four very specific properties. Cannabis works with the cancer cells, not with the healthy cells. It impacts the cancer cells in four specific ways. Does not let the cancer cells multiply, anti-proliferative. Does not let the cancer cells spread, anti-metastatic. Does not let the blood supply continued anti-agenesis and causes cell death, also known as apoptosis. We know that cannabis is two times more stronger than hydrocodone. Cannabis is 20 times anti-inflammatory property of aspirin. And aspirin, people can lead to death. We know also that people suffer from what is known as clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. Dr. Ethan Russo has identified this with migraines, fibromyalgia, IBS. I have seen this in my own practice. Treatment and supplementing with cannabinoids helps and remove these illnesses and helps people improve their quality of life. We also know that patients that suffer from traumatic brain injuries Cannabis can also prevent the worsening of these symptoms and can also be used in the prevention of complications from traumatic brain injuries. Yes, complications and prevention of traumatic brain injuries. We also know that it is used for PTS patients. Our veterans have suffered with it and so many other people suffer with it. Even today, due to COVID, many people are suffering from post-traumatic stress. The modes of administration can vary from individual and your choices. Inhalation can be combusted or vapor. It is a quick onset and greater viability. Topicals can be applied with no intoxicating effects, lotions, creams, and balms. Transdermals can also be applied, but they can have some effects in our body since it can be absorbed. Suppositories that can be used vaginally or rectally. 
oral administration under the tongue or ingested liquids, strips, capsules, tinctures, and the list goes on and on. Edibles in the form of candies and foods. And yes, these are a longer duration and can also have a longer effect as well. There's also new beverages that are created with and without alcohol. My youngest is four in my clinic and my eldest is 98, so we have a variety of options that we see. Dr. Uma says that we are facing an opioid epidemic and people on multiple problems, and this is a very safe solution. Cannabis is not for everyone, Yet, it should be a first-line option and not the last resort. I please ask everybody, please open your hearts. You don't need to use this medicine, but you know somebody that can benefit from it. Open your mind because we all have an endocannabinoid system. And as clinicians and patients, this opens doors for a better communication and a better relationship. When it comes to the use of cannabis, I like to use the word titrate versus dose because cannabis is a form of personalized medicine and titrate means a little bit at a time. Dosing is a very pharmaceutical word and it means that you're going to get the same amount every time. That is not the truth always with cannabis. So I like to use the word titrate. Dr. Uma has three rules. Rule number one, always hydrate before you medicate. Why? Because cannabis is a dehydrant. Dry mouth, dry throat, and these are some of the side effects that people can have. Start out low or very low and slowly titrate up or down and always have food on board. Why? Because cannabis causes your blood sugar to drop, which can cause you to feel anxious, and we don't want that. So make sure that you have food on board. And the third and most important rule, Write it down, journal, because it's all about you and your experience and how each time it can be a little bit different. So it's important to write things down. It's called Total Healthcare THC, and the three words are educate, embrace, and empower. I'm very proud to say all of our patients know about the endocannabinoid system. We embrace cannabis as a safe alternative and we empower our patients to have a better quality of life. The medical benefits that we see from cannabis is an option to relieve chronic pain. And yes, it does improve lung capacity. It helps patients lose weight, and for others that need to gain weight, it helps them as well. It helps regulate and even prevent diabetes. It fights cancers and the four properties that I've discussed earlier. It helps treat depression. It helps and promises hope for patients that have autism, not only for the individuals, but also for the families caring for individuals with autism. It helps regulate seizures. It helps mend our bone. It helps with ADHD and ADD. It's a viable treatment for glaucoma. It helps it helps alleviate anxiety. It helps slow down Alzheimer's diseases. It helps the pain of arthritis. It helps with PTS symptoms. My patients with multiple sclerosis have been able to use cannabis as their only medication and have been able to cope and be able to put their illnesses into remission. It helps with my patients with hepatitis C for not only the treatment, but also to help cope with the symptoms, along with the effectiveness of their other treatments. Inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, IBD, patients with multiple symptoms from constipation to diarrhea, cannabis is sometimes the only thing that is helping these people. It helps our patients with their tremors, with Parkinson's, and yes, it is a viable option for the treatment of patients that suffer from alcoholism. In my children with autism, I truly believe this must be offered to them as an option. There's been lots of reports 
and lots of research. So please, no more should we say that there is not enough research. Please Google or go to www.pubmed.gov. There's lots and lots of information. There's lots and lots of studies and more to be done. We know in the United States where cannabis is available and accessible, there's been a 25% reduction in opioid deaths. In studies, patients prefer cannabis as a substitute to opioids if it's available. My seniors are becoming very sassy these days. They prefer it, and 90 plus percent of our elderly prefer this versus their other prescription meds, and they're able to lower their meds as well. In 1970, what started out as a Controlled Substance Act, which put cannabis into prohibition and keeps it there, has made some changes. In 2014, the Agricultural Act was passed when Obama was president. In December 2018, it went into law when President Trump was in office. Cannabis, what we know, belongs to the family of Cannabisia, the genus Cannabis sativa, and there are three species, Cannabis sativa, Cannabis indica, and Cannabis ruralis. The two well-studied and most commonly spoken about are Cannabis sativa and Cannabis indica. I like to explain sativa as starts with the letter S, I think of sunshine, more uplifting. Indica, I think of the letter I, and insomnia, more sedating. These are just classifications. Most of them are a hybrid and they'll have properties of a sativa or an indica. What we know is the difference between hemp and marijuana. What is it? Man-made. The difference is based on the percentage of a component known as Delta 9 THC the intoxicating component in cannabis. If it is less than 0.3%, again, less than or equal to 0.3%, it is considered as hemp. If it is greater than 0.3% Delta 9 THC, it is considered marijuana. Ultimately, it's all cannabis, folks. It's a guideline, a line that we have created. In some countries, that is, this is up to 1%. I like to use the analogy when we look at citrus and cannabis. We've got lemon, limes, and oranges, but we break it down into sour or sweet. When it comes to cannabis, they've broken it down based on the Delta 9 THC. The three species, as I mentioned, sativa, more taller, leaner, and thinner leaves versus the sativa, more bushier, thicker leaves, and ruralis, a combination in between, stringier. What we understand is that this beautiful plant, cannabis, has multiple, multiple components. We've learned about cannabinoids, flavonoids, and terpenoids. The terpenes are what give it the aroma. The flavonoids is what give it the colors. And the cannabinoids are the components that work with our beautiful receptors in our body. The diagram here on the left by Richard Rose explains how in the different forms of cannabis from when it's in the raw form, when it is heated or dried, the different cannabinoids that we have identified and much more to learn. The common cannabis terpenes that we've learned about, limonene, pinene, myrcene, linalool, and camphorine. These are all different types of terpenes, 
we see that how it has an impact as an anti-anxiety, anti-depressant, for asthma, anti-inflammation, and yes, for chronic pain, insomnia, and the list goes on and on. What we understand is that each of these terpenes can also be reintroduced and be combined with various types of cannabinoids in different ratios to have different impacts to treat different illnesses and diseases. We've learned about CBN, CBC, CBD, CBG, THC, THCV, and these are just a few of the cannabinoids and CBD, which has been around and much more readily accepted since it has the non-intoxicating products, comes in three forms. It can come from hemp derived, it can come from what is known as marijuana or synthetically made, but the CBD can vary in how it is produced with different products. We are also learning about new cannabinoids, THCP and CBDP. We're understanding how these cannabinoids are creating the intoxicating effects. Also properties as far as the anti-inflammatory and the anti and carcinogenic ways that we can use it for, for treatment for cancer patients as well. Much more to learn. What we understand is that this beautiful plant, every part of this plant, from the seeds to the flower to the herd, every portion and the root can be used for some purpose. The entire plant can be created for chemicals and also cleaning agents, the cell fluids for abrasives, the stalk, the fiber, different types of diapers, fabrics, handbags. We know paper can be created much more lasting and more preservable. Building materials that we have, fiber boards, all the components that are used in building that can be toxic can be replaced with the materials created from the herd of the hemp plant. The hemp seed can be used for nutrition, food, oils, bombs, cosmetics, medicine, parts, seed cakes and food. Extracts can be made, isolates, and the list goes on and on and on. Cannabis for our livestock. Imagine a world if our animals were fed hemp. The animals themselves would not suffer the illnesses of inflammation. We then would not be secondary consumers of our chickens, the pork, the beef that we consume. The inflammation in the animals, we then consume it, ultimately creating inflammatory diseases. Our animals, our pets, are fed the byproducts of these animals. Imagine where their lives and the illnesses that we can prevent for our pets and our livestock. What we know is that everything plastic can be made from hemp and plastic made from hemp is biodegradable. Yes, biodegradable. We can leave this planet better than how we found it. The U.S. could save around 4 billion trees per year if we switch back to using hemp from paper instead of timber. It was known as a billion dollar crop. Imagine where our world would be. Henry Ford had built a car that ran and fueled on hemp. Imagine the world had it not changed due to the tyrants, the hearse the DuPont, the Rockefeller, the Carnegie, and none. The health and wellness of our world today with legalization, the profit, and yes, climate change. We are facing 
a huge problem that impacts all of us today and the future of man and the world that we live in. And we have a solution. Hemp food, one of my favorites. One serving, three tablespoons, gives you 10 grams of protein, 21 amino acids, and nine of them are essential. It's one of the most hypoallergenic items. It helps with fiber. It's got omega-3s. It's got the perfect omega-3, omega-6 ratios. It's good for our mind, for our muscles, for our body, and every part of this plant, the hemp hearts, can be used. The hemp seeds also provide us with vitamin E, magnesium, potassium, manganese, and so many other components, which also help as an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. What we know is that hemp has multiple facets that it can be used for. When compared to wheat and corn, it produces 8.5 tons, 8 tons of material per hectare per year. Hemp produces 25 tons. Oil from palm takes five years before it fruits. Wood trees take 50 to 100 years. Hemp matures in four months and it can be harvested three times per year. Usual fibers, one acre of hemp equals un usable fibers for four acres of wood and two acres of cotton. Hemp is naturally a hardy plant, pest resistant. It needs no pesticides to cultivate. Hemp is also drought resistant. Hemp is biofuel. Hemp fuel burns cleaner. It has four times the biomass and eight times the methanol potential compared to our current mainstream biofuel mass that we use today compared to corn. Hemp, hemp would be planted in just 6% of the continental Americas. It can be sustainably supplied, demand for gas and fuel for the whole country. In the words of Henry Ford, I'm gonna repeat that again. Why use up the forests which were centuries in the making and the onlines in which required ages to lay down if we can get the equivalent of forest and mineral products in an annual growth of the hemp fields, Henry Ford. Purifier, hemp is a natural unique ability to detoxify the land where it is planted on. It can absorb the leftover forest on farmlands after the poultry fertilizers. It can absorb other harmful substances. Hemp planted in Chernobyl and Russia for, due to the contamination and even in Japan after its incidents there. Hemp is plastic. Conventional plastics can be replaced with cannabis i.e. hemp, it's biodegradable and much less harmful substances are re released in the process of making this. Currently, car companies like Audi and BM, Chrysler are looking into these as alternatives as well. Hemp is construction material. Hemp fiber mixed with some of the bonding agents can create hempcrete. Hempcrete is a building brick, lighter, the normal bricks. Hempcrete is fire retardant. One cubic meter of hempcrete will absorb 165 kilograms of CO2 over time. Hemp fibers can be turned into wall insulation. Hemp homes are healthy, fire and pest resistant. No termites, vapor permeable, breathable, natural material, preventing no off-gassing, no molds, no termites, no dry rot, and clean indoor air. Hemp is antimicrobial. We know that if hemp could have been available now, 
with all the mass and materials that have been discarded, if this could have been used as the microfiber material, imagine where it could be. It can be used in sheets, in the hospitals, in your bedding, in your homes. It can prevent the contaminations from what we know from bacteria as well. Cotton fibers are short fibers, one to two millimeters. Hemp fibers are meters long, four to five meters. It's stronger than cotton. Levi Strauss was originally created with hemp. It's much softer and warmer and water resistant than cotton. It has high insulatory factors. It keeps you cool when needed and keeps you warm in those cold nights. Hemp will reduce pesticide pollution, reduce soil erosion, and it will help restore our soil. It will produce biodegradable plastics. It will absorb the lethal metal. It will produce inexhaustible biofuel. It will reduce our carbon emission impact and reduce deforestation. What's the differences that have been cut? As we said, it can impact our water, our soil, less pesticides, impact our land, and ultimately much stronger. Dr. Uma says cannabis cares. It provides choices, alternatives. There's plenty of research, and yes, more needs to be done, but the research is there. Education is very important about the stigma and the endocannabinoid system, and yes, it provides solutions. Receptors are made for compounds we produce. Let me repeat that again. Receptors are made for compounds that we produce, not because there is a plant out there, in the words of Raphael Meshulam. Cannabis works, no doubt about it, it works. Essentially, every disease that we investigate, the endocannabinoid system is involved. I am an educator, an activist, and an advocate, and I fight for my patients and my healthcare providers. Let me repeat this again. Make the most you can of the Indian hemp seed. The hemp may be sown anywhere. George Washington. Hemp is the first necessity to the wealth and protection of our country. Thomas Jefferson. Hemp will be the future of mankind, or there won't be a future. Jack Harrow. Lincoln, let me repeat that again. Two of my favorite things are sitting on the front porch, smoking a pipe or sweet hemp and playing my Homer harmonica, Abraham Lincoln. I could not find a single confirmed overdose death in the words of Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Uma says, cannabis is for people, pets, the planet, for peace and profit, and your profit is your health and wellness. The pillars that I fight for and look forward to is to seeing legalization throughout the world. I want to see laboratory standards so that we can have a label to identify cannabinoids, terpenoids, the flavonoids, also for testing of pesticides, heavy metals, and contamination. I want to see cultivation be able to be even in your own backyard. Multiple products can be created, one that can suit all of our societies for humans and for pets. Education is the key. The stigma regarding cannabis must be changed, and the world must know about the endocannabinoid system, and we do it through education. Cannabis is for health and wellness locally and globally. That's what I say. I am Dr. Uma Dhanabalan at upliftinghealthandwellness.com. 
I say safety first, do no harm. Our phone number is 508-444-2324. And remember, cannabis is an entrance to a better quality of life, an exit from pharmaceuticals, narcotics, alcohol, and nicotine. Reach one, teach 10. Teach one, reach 10. Please pass the message and the information that you have learned today. I thank you all. I thank everyone that has been here listening to this and look forward to your questions. Look forward to helping in any way I can. And remember, cannabis is a global solution. Thank you. Namaste.